Welcome back and what we're going to look at now is timer principles, the general principles of clocks and timers in microprocessors. So we'll start off by looking at what these are used for because that's not immediately obvious from their name. There's quite a lot of variety of uses. Uh, we'll look at some specifics, for example, real-time clock and how they're used in terms of software in a microcontroller. <coughs> we'll look at watchdog timers at a really big important topic for reliability and we'll talk about pulse width modulation maybe you're looking a little bit about the reality behind these types of clocks and signals so first of all digital circuits that we use today are almost all synchronous and synchronous means that they all run in step to a clock some things inside a microprocessor need to be done fast. Some things only need to be done slow. Um, some things need precise timing of, for certain frequencies. and Other things need precise timing, but of a different frequency. So what actually happens is in any realistic system today, uh, there's multiple clocks, maybe many clocks. And each of these clocks are a precise and well-defined timing. Now, one of the pieces of background information is that you should know that CPUs and other digital circuits consume more power when they're clocked faster. And in fact, it's not linear. It doesn't mean that if you clock it twice as fast, it uses twice as much power. If you clock it twice as fast, it might use three times as much power. And the graph here is taken from an academic paper, and the academic paper looks at various ARM-based or Cortex processors and they're operating at different speeds. And if you go from the left of the graph up to the right of the graph, then the speed increases in megahertz. This is the sort of processors that you would use in your mobile phone. And we can see that the amount of power that's being used per processor core increases quite rapidly as you start to increase frequency. So one of the best ways that we can save power inside a CPU is to, is to clock it slower. And in fact, an even better way is to clock it at zero, which means effectively turning it off. If you remove a clock from a digital circuit, you effectively turn it off. So this is one reason why there's different speeds of clock inside a CPU. For those of you into overclocking, you'll know that you can go the other way as well. You can speed up. So the CPU's um, system clock is, is uh, generally very precise, and it's uh, created from an external oscillator. And the reason is, is that you can create a silicon oscillator inside a CPU, but it tends to be not very precise. Um, you know, it might vary quite a little bit over time. It might go faster and slower. But if you have an external crystal, you can very easily get a crystal that's accurate to one part per million, even one part per billion. So you get really precise clock timings. A cheaper version of a crystal that's less accurate uh, is a ceramic resonator that's often used in small microprocessors. And these, these input a... Um, a signal or they're used inside the CPU to create an oscillating clock but in the CPU that's divided down to connect uh, sorry to use inside the CPU for different parts and peripherals at a lower frequency and when you divide it down usually you're dividing it by an integer multiple so you can take a clock you can divide it by two you can divide it by three or divide it by four and so on it's very difficult to take a, an input clock signal and divide the frequency by 1.5. It can be done, but it's much easier to divide it by 2, or 3, or 4, or 1,000. So usually, the, uh, the main oscillator is tied to the system clock. So in an ARM Cortex, there's a small arm cortex that might be 48 megahertz or 40 megahertz or 80 megahertz or something and internally you'd get clocks that derive from that there might be a 24 megahertz clock there might be a 6 megahertz clock or whatever uh, and it's quite easy to see how you would divide a, a fast clock 
So this is an example of an MCLK, it's a typical abbreviation for machine clock, and it's uh, going one zero, one zero, one zero, and so on. And we just count zero, one, two, three, four, five. When we get eight, we make an output signal go high. Um, when we get past 16, which should be just here, we make the output signal go low again. And what this is doing is it's dividing down the input clock. In this case, it's, uh, it's divided by 8. There's also usually a real-time clock. It's a separate crystal or ceramic resonator in a micro uh, connected to a microprocessor that runs at 32.768 kilohertz. And you'll find this crystal, this strange frequency in everything from your mobile phone, in some cases, to um, if you have a, a digital watch, to your desktop PC. They all have this crystal. It's called a watch crystal. It's a strange number, right? 32.768 kilohertz. Well, there's a reason for that. If you take a watch crystal and you put it into a counter, so you use that signal to drive a counter, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. When it gets to 32767, 32,767, then you toggle an output and you reset the counter and you start from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You get a 32,767 again, toggle the output. The toggle, toggle, toggle output is 1 hertz. 1 hertz is 1 per second. So this is a um, 1 per second signal that would drive something like a real-time clock, an RTC. An RTC unit, the hardware, generally takes those seconds and it counts them. It counts 60 of them to make a minute, and it counts 60 of the minutes to make an hour, and so on. And by doing that, it can maintain an internal calendar. A decent RTC unit probably has an algorithm in there that handles even leap years and months with the irregular number of days. And the RTC could provide an operating system with the sort of information it needs to provide date or time to your program. In a uh, typical system, like a desktop PC or a laptop PC, the real-time clock has a battery backup, and that allows it to keep time, even when the power is removed from your circuit. If your real-time clock backup battery has failed, then you're going to get the problem that when you plug in your device, the time is reset. Um, if you plug in your microwave and the time is flashing at zero, 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 it means that there's no battery backup to the real-time clock. Some of them don't have it, or maybe it's just flat. So we've seen something about the clock circuitry already, um, but we haven't really talked about timers. So timers, they are things that count clock cycles for a particular purpose. And that might be that they need to measure the duration, so they count how many clock cycles between something happening and something else happening. Or it might be that they need to control something with regular timing. Uh, for example, they flash an LED on, off, on, off, with regular timing. The so timer is a, is a peripheral unit built into most single-chip micros or system on chip processors that, that's uh, it's got clock inputs, it's got internal counters and so on, and it can raise and interrupt. When the timer reaches a certain point, it can interrupt the CPU. So you can see that you can use this like a, a stopwatch or a timer on your mobile phone or on your digital watch. And they're used in software for many things. When you need to you know, do some precise timing, work out how long a system call is taking, or you need to control a peripheral. Very useful. Most CPUs, uh, most microprocessors and single chip systems, they all have multiple timers inside them. We will see one later that's dedicated for a particular purpose. But let's look at the general ones first. So here's an example. Uh, with a 48 megahertz clock, it's probably an ARM processor. And if we set a timer that raises an interrupt every time it counts to 48,000. So what's happening there? Well, 
we've got a clock that's 48 megahertz that's toggling 48 million times every second and we're going to count to 48,000 so let's divide that 48,000 divided by 48 million and we get 0.001 seconds which happens to be one millisecond so if we have a timer that's fed with the 48 megahertz clock and it has an interrupt every time it counts up to 48,000 then that duration is one millisecond, it's a one millisecond timer now we can program this to be one shot or continuous, we'll see this in a moment one shot means you measure just a single one millisecond duration or if we have that running continuously then we get a one millisecond tick 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 and many operating systems have a regular time tick built into them that might be one millisecond it might be a different figure in an older operating system it might be a hundred milliseconds the operating system uses this for many things a regular time tick 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 and this is exactly how it's implemented imagine you're controlling something with your microprocessor you have a GPIO pin general purpose IO and it's a pin we can set it high or low and we're controlling something that needs to have a signal like is shown here in orange a signal that's high for 13 milliseconds and low for 13 milliseconds high low high low continuously so how would you do this in software well, a, a beginner to programming might do something like this. Have a, a loop, which is infinite, it never ends. And inside the loop, they might say, let's set the GPI output high. And keep it high, sleep for 13 milliseconds, 0.013 seconds. And then set it low, and then sleep for another 13 milliseconds, and set it high again by going back to the beginning of the loop you are not going to get what you want and what you're actually going to get is what you see here in the dotted line sometime after it should go high it does go high indeed sometimes after it should go low it will go low indeed and sometimes it will not go high when you want it to why well because your code your code here could be interrupted at any time so maybe after you go to sleep here maybe an interrupt occurs and your CPU goes and services some interrupt that takes 20 milliseconds well if it's servicing an interrupt that takes 20 milliseconds it's not running your code and in fact if you look at high level program language when it says sleep for a certain length of time what it actually means is it sleeps for at least that length of time. It could sleep for longer. It will never sleep for less. So what happens is that things tend to stretch out. Once you've slept for a longer period, you wake up and you still start counting again 13 milliseconds. But you might sleep a bit longer again. What happens is everything stretches out and it becomes very, very irregular. You don't do it in this way. How you would do it is you would configure a timer. Okay, so when we configure timers, the first thing to note is that I said there's many timers inside most microcontrollers, and these timers you can configure them to take their input from different clock sources. So we already had an example with a 48 megahertz clock. So you can have a, a timer that takes its input from the 48 megahertz clock, but your CPU has got different clocks. Maybe you can get your timer to use an input from a 6 MHz clock or even the 32.768 kilohertz clock or the 1 second clock maybe it all depends on how that microprocessor is wired up internally what we do know is that the timers can select their clock you have to look at the data sheet to find out exactly what frequency those clocks will be now the timer inside is actually just a binary counter 0 1 2 3 4 5 so on 
and they can be configured to count up or down and these are shown in the little graphs to the right starting from a particular value a down counter counts down until it reaches zero an up counter starts at zero and counts upwards until it reaches a target value now you write some software to configure what that timer then does when it hits either the target value or the zero for the up or down count. How much the timer can count depends on its width. So if you look in the microprocessor datasheet, it might say you have a 12-bit timer. Well, a 12-bit timer can only store two to the power of 12 in terms of its largest count value, which should be 2048. So it would count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 to 2047. You might have a 20-bit timer or 48-bit timer inside a typical microprocessor. Sometimes they're very flexible. You can have one timer which is fed from a previous timer. So if the timers aren't big enough, you can daisy chain them. But that's all processor dependent. Now we were talking about what happens when the timer hits zero or its target. Well, the most important thing that you can do is you can tell that timer to raise an interrupt when it hits its end point. So if it's a timer which is counting down, raise an interrupt when it hits zero. If it's a timer that you've configured to, to count upwards, raise an interrupt when it hits its target value. It doesn't have to raise an interrupt, but you can ask it to. You can also get that timer to behave differently at that point. It can either stop, which means it's in a one-shot mode, and counts down, counts down and finishes, or counts up and then finishes, or you can allow it to free run. What free running means is, let's say an up counter starts at zero, it counts one, two, three, four, five, six, it hits the target, and when it hits the target, it raises an interrupt, it's not shown here, and then it continues counting after it hits the target and it continues counting up to its maximum. When you have a binary counter, it counts in binary um, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And when that counter reaches its maximum, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and you add one more, it wraps around to zero. So that's why you get these things that count upwards. They pass the target, raise an interrupt, get to the maximum value, and then wrap around to zero again. And then count upwards, wrap around to zero. Or they count downwards from zero. You subtract one, you count down from zero, and you get one, 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 the maximum value. And then you continue to count down again. A periodic timer is one when it hits the target value, it reloads it with zero, or when it reaches zero, it reloads it again with the start value. So it might start at a certain value you've programmed in, counts down to zero. When it hits zero, it raises interrupt, and then loads the target value and then counts down, 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 down to zero, then loads the target value and counts down, down, down to zero. Or going upwards, it starts at zero, counts up to the target value, raises an interrupt, goes back to zero again, raises the target value. And this is the most useful, the periodic timer. I said there was a special one, it's a watchdog timer. And what's special um, is that the purpose we use it for and how it's wired up partly how it's wired up internally. So like the other timers, it's it's a block that's got a counter in it and it takes an input from one of several clock sources 
and it has a configured target value. Um, it counts upwards. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And the only difference between this and the other timers is that when it hits that target, the interrupt is a reset. Sometimes it's a reset, sometimes it's a special watchdog timer reset, but it's it's not a general purpose interrupt. It's a reset interrupt. It resets the CPU. It tells the CPU to restart. And the idea is that your software is supposed to periodically clear the watchdog timer counter. So the watchdog timer goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Periodically you reset it to 0 so it never reaches the target. The only time it will reach the target is when your code has stopped resetting or clearing that watchdog timer. And the only time your code should stop clearing the watchdog timer is when your code is crashed. What that means is if you write code that periodically clears the watchdog timer, all's working great. When your code crashes, the watchdog timer doesn't get cleared. In a very short time, the watchdog timer keeps counting up, hits the maximum, resets the CPU. You can disable this in software. Um, some CPUs, many CPUs, in fact, when you reset the CPU or when you turn them on, the watchdog timer is enabled by default. This is actually this is actually pretty um, annoying sometimes. Uh, I remember in industry working on a microprocessor project, and we were all being driven crazy because we couldn't debug a problem. Everybody would get the unit, we'd turn it on, and we'd be debugging stuff in software, and we'd be running our code, and our code would crash seemingly at random places, and we'd single step and it would crash. We'd let the code run and it would crash and it would crash at different places. And we couldn't work out why did the code keep crashing. It turned out there was a problem in that the watchdog timer response. What was happening is our code was running perfectly fine but we forgot to disable the watchdog timer. So after a certain period our code looked like it crashed. It didn't. It was the watchdog timer. When we uh, remembered, oh, we need to turn off the watchdog timer, it's on by default, we need to turn it off, suddenly our code worked perfectly well. And this is essential for unattended systems. I spent quite a large part of my life designing satellites. I designed the computers in Singapore's first satellite. And when you have a satellite in space, you can't really send an astronaut up to press a reset button when your satellite goes wrong. You need a watchdog timer to check your software. If it ever crashes, it will make sure it resets that satellite. It's probably one of the most important systems in there. One more topic we need to look at in, in this is something which is the output of these sorts of timer modules. And uh, this is called pulse width modulation. It's pretty useful. It's used in many things. It's used for, for example, making LEDs bright or dim. It's used for class D power amplifiers. If anyone's into making a loud noise for music, you probably have a class D switching power amplifier. This uses pulse width modulation. And many people say this is a bit like a poor man's digital to analog converter. Well, in fact, if you clock it very fast, it can be a good digital to analog converter but I'm talking about very, very fast. So the idea is, is illustrated in this diagram. Uh, if we had a uh, microprocessor with a GPIO output pin that was driving a resistor and then an LED, and we know that the LED brightness depends on the amount of current which flows through the LED. So if we turn the GPIO on, pin on here and we leave it on continuously, it's going to be 100% brightness, okay? That's as bright as it can get. But if we turn it on and then off, on and then off rapidly, by rapidly it means it's so fast that the eye can't follow it, the eye can't see the flickering, 
what you'll see is that if you turn it on and off 50% of the time, 50% duty cycle, then it will be 50% bright. If you turn it on for a quarter of the time and off for three quarters of the time, it'll be 25% bright. If you turn it, just blip it on, blip it on, and it's only on for 10% of the time, it will be 10% brightness. Obviously, if you have the thing low all the time, it will be off. Now, what's happening here? We're not changing the frequency of the signal. We're not saying send a signal that's you know, oscillating like that or a signal that's oscillating like that. No, not a fast or slow signal. We're changing the pulse width. We're keeping the frequency the same, but the pulse width is changing. And that's called the duty cycle. I think duty cycle comes from the army. I guess, I don't know. It means that, for example, in a day, how much time do you have to stand duty? Do you stand duty for four hours in a day? So that's 424. Or do you stand duty for 12 hours in a day? It's 12 out of 24. It's a 50% duty cycle. Now, the programmer configures a clock source, and the programmer configures a duty cycle, and the polarity in processors that have um, pulse width modulation hardware. And just as exactly the same as timers, it's, it's all done with counters. So I've got an example here. I've got a clock source that's oscillating up and down here. And that clock is driving a counter. It's counting from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and so on. And we've set period as 10. So when that counter gets to 10, the next clock cycle, it is reset to 0. OK. Oh, I'm sorry. We've set the duty cycle to 4, so after it's set to 0, then it counts to 1, 2, 3, 4, and then it toggles the output to be high. Um, why do I know it toggles the output to be high? And that's because we set the polarity to low. So the thing starts its output low. So let's just start from count value 0. Count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 4 is the duty cycle register. We toggle the output high. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We toggle the output low. 1, 2, 3, 4, high. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, low, and so on. But it's all done automatically. You set it up in software, and after that it just carries on. And the duty cycle is usually expressed in a percentage, and it's the, the period minus the duty cycle divided by the period. In this case, period is 10, duty cycle is 4, but because ca the count starts at 0, then the actual period is 10 plus 1, and the actual duty cycle is 4 plus 1, so 11 and 5. So in this case, the duty cycle is about 55%. Final thing we should note here. We, we always draw our clocks as perfect square waves. They're not really perfect in reality. They've got rise times and fall times. And when they rise, they tend to ring. When they fall, they ring. And because the rise time is not perfectly vertical, it's got a bit of an angle, and when you, that crosses over the midpoint, which is where you take your timing from for um, at one clock period. It's TCLK in this diagram here. TCLK is going from the midpoint here to the midpoint just there. And because the rise time is um, sort of angled, it's not perfectly vertical, then there's a bit of uncertainty in that rise time. And each rise time is slightly different. It causes a bit of clock jitter. So the TCLK actually changes a little tiny bit in practice, and that's called jitter. We can see the high period of a clock, the low period of a clock, the rise time, and the fall time. This applies to any clock. It doesn't need to be a timer clock or a microprocessor clock. It could be a real-time clock. It could be a watchdog timer output. It could even be the output of a GPIO pin.
if it's periodic, if t uh, high plus t low, or uh, if t high is always the same, t low is always the same, it's periodic, that means tclk indicates the clock period, then the frequency is 1 over the clock period, down here. And the duty cycle is the high period divided by the clock period, or the high portion divided by the clock period. Um, this is generic to all sorts of different clocks. It's not perfect. If you see, if you're an overclocker and you want to make your system run faster, you'll make your clock period shorter, so your clock is going faster. And then what's happening is you can see the ringing part at the beginning here. If you make your clock really fast, there's going to be too much ringing. In fact, really fast, and then the rise time becomes important. So this is just something that ties our theory a little bit more into reality. And the only other thing to say is that, of course, that uh, most of the things that I'm talking about, the timers, the counters, the watchdog timer, um, the um, pulse width modulation, these are very much dependent on particular microprocessors and different micros have got different internal peripherals and they're programmed in different ways. So we call this um, timers. <laughs> it really could be called counters and clocks because the timers are counters and the important thing is that they count up or down and they've got target values and that they're driven by clocks, one of several clock sources. So we looked at clock and timer technology. We looked specifically at real-time clocks we looked at how they're used inside microcontrollers, raising interrupts from them and so on. Um, the, the behavior when they count down to zero or count up to target. And we looked at watchdog timers in particular, important things that can reset your processor when your code's crashed. And then we left with pulse width modulation and a bit of information about real clocks rather than those perfect square ways that we've been drawing all the way through this. So I hope you enjoy using timers watchdog timers, real-time clocks, and other associated technologies in your microprocessors. Thank you for your attention.